Welcome to the many JFN members on today's call. And for those new to JFN, permit me to share a bit about our organization. JFN works with Jewish funders at the individual and collective levels to improve the quality of their giving and maximize their impact as they make the change they want to see in the world. JFN leverages the power and the creativity of networks to strengthen Jewish philanthropy around the world. Our year-round programming aims to keep members up to speed on the latest and most pressing topics in philanthropy and the Jewish community. We aim to help members build their philanthropic toolkits and explore relevant and important issues. Today's conversation is at the forefront of today's society. It seems that every day another story surfaces about a powerful man's pattern of sexual harassment, abuse, or assault. And the Jewish community is not immune, either from this problem or from the implications of society's new willingness to take it more seriously than in the past. Jewish funders have the responsibility and power to make change. And today's conversation will explore that responsibility and look at how Jewish philanthropy can be used to address, prevent, and ultimately, we hope, eradicate sexual harassment in all forms, in the organizations that we fund, in our own foundations and social circles, and everywhere else. I'm pleased and delighted to introduce today's panelists. Sarah Miller, is the Managing Director of Richard Levin & Associates, a title that encompasses her role in overseeing a number of marketing, operational, project management, and business development activities at this consultancy. She is a graduate of the Hornstein Jewish Professional Leadership Program, and she earned an MBA at the Heller School for Public Policy at Brandeis. She is the co-author of It's Time to Act, Ending Sexual Harassment in the Jewish Communal Space. Rabbi David Teutsch is Professor Emeritus at the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College. Trained as a rabbi, he earned his doctorate from the Wharton School at Penn and is the author of A Guide to Jewish Practice, Family and Sexual Ethics. And he is the co-author of B'Tselem Elohim, Jewish Ethics, Sexual Harassment and the Workplace of the Future. And Lisa Eisen is the Vice President of the Charles and Lynn Schusterman Family Foundation. Lisa spearheads efforts to ensure vibrant Jewish life by supporting initiatives around the world that empower young Jews to embrace the joy of Judaism, build inclusive Jewish communities, support the state of Israel, and repair the world. We are in for a treat with these three panelists. So I'm going to turn it over first to Sarah, who is going to frame our conversation today with some details about anecdote, anecdotal evidence that that she and her team have discovered that will help us understand how funders can surface rumors and how funders can intervene with this very, very difficult issue of sexual harassment. Sarah, please, over to you. Thank you, Samantha. Um, so uh, brief uh, information about how our article came about. Um, at Richard Levin and Associates, we're really in the business of listening. Um, we occupy a space where people really feel that they can safely bring their concerns, whether through coaching or other relationships that we have with them. So we have this, this pretty wide swath of professionals and lay leaders that we hear from on a fairly regular basis. Um, and as a result, we feel we hear it a little more quickly, quickly and openly than others might. Um, because of this interesting position that we, we occupy. Um, we feel we try to empower those who are speaking with us, guide them, support them, strengthen their position, um, and help them to hopefully do the right thing. Um, so we had heard a number of examples over time. Um, and finally, the way you know things were, were surfacing, both in our community as well as in the wider um, space culture that we occupy, um, we, we said enough is enough. We, we have to say something. Um, so some examples on very different levels of uh, what we heard people behaving badly. One would be um, as, you know, cut and dry as a chief development officer essentially being propositioned for a seven figure gift, all the way down to, you know, objectification of frontline engagement staff you know, assessing their looks as the reason they're successful to a job on a, you know, site visit from a funder, for example. Um, so we really wanted to help leaders and funders think about the ways that they can be instrumental in the dismantling of this inappropriate behavior. 
Um, and there are a couple pieces that, that we see as um, both, both issue areas, but also action areas. Um, one of which would be uh, organizations that you fund, that you've heard things about. Um, what are the ways that you can use what you've heard and the power that you have in this relationship to impact a problematic situation? Um, if you don't act on rumors that you hear, does that make you complicit as a conversation, um, whether legally or morally? And I know we'll get to that a little bit later with David. Um, there's the issue of, of being a good funder, not taking advantage of power, whether sexually or otherwise. Um, you know, I, I, I think back to um, Gates of Prayer translated part of the giver wrote as uh, help us to use our strength for good and not for evil, for example. Um, we have the issue area of supporting grantees who reject an offer. Um, so this came to light in the very brave piece by Rhonda Abrams at the Greater Portland Hillel, where she was brave enough to speak out and was provided a um, both professional as well as financial safety net um, in rejecting an offer that was tainted in that way. Um, Otherwise, you know, there are fears in, by many in the community that this could turn back the clock on women in leadership, which we already know is an issue in our community, and we wouldn't want that to impact people's um, perception of the issue. Um, we know also that not everyone feels that they're in a position to speak out now, and we're certainly not condemning those who, who aren't turning away these gifts, but we're hoping that by providing the support, the tide could be changed. Um, Another issue area would be something like a legal aid fund. This uh, obviously became um, most uh, oh, we became most aware of it through uh, the Golden Globes and, and Hollywood, the, the fund that was created. But we also know that nonprofit organizations are not always best equipped to uh, provide for the heavy legal fees required to do the right thing. And in supporting um, those who we fund, that's another way to do it. Um, and then there's the issue as you know, we could think about even today, um, webinars and panels, who to invite, who to disinvite. Um, there's also the question of what is your role in the formation of this panel? Are you funding it? Are you hosting it? Are you participating in it? Those are all different nuances that impact how you may decide to move forward. So in short, there's a lot to think about. Um, for each of your particular situations, there may be responses that are most easily accessible to you and which fit your setup best. But it's an imperative that we as a field, I feel, must do better. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to David Teutsch. So let me start with some of the Jewish underpinnings of uh, an approach to this issue. Uh, perhaps the most basic is uh, the statement in Genesis that all human beings are created B'Tselem Elohim in the image of God. That means each of us uh, ought to see the other fully as subject and never as object. So um, any objectification of women, or of men for that matter, uh, is, is a violation of that fundamental commitment. Um, one of the key moral terms that's related to that is kavod or dignity. Um, every human being is entitled to be treated with kavod and um, the Talmudic rabbis were interested in regulating that around such things as privacy in uh, using the bathroom in terms of receiving wages at the end of the day, a whole variety of, of different categories. In terms of this issue, kavod means knowing that you can uh, do your work, uh, participate in the community in a way that makes you actually safe and also feel safe, which may not necessarily be the same thing. Um, that uh, commitment to dignity extends hopefully to every uh, employee of our organizations and uh, foundations, whether they're Jewish or not. Uh, one of the commandments that's uh, found in Leviticus is hocheach tochiach et amitecha, uh, you shall surely reprove your neighbor. Um, 
what that means is anytime anybody sees someone committing a reprehensible act, it is incumbent on us to address that. Um, the um, corollary in uh, more American thinking is silence is consent. If you see somebody doing something wrong and you don't speak up and address it, you have implicitly told them it's okay to do that. And in, in terms of Jewish tradition, um, doing that makes you complicit and uh, partly responsible for the damage that's done. So how, do, how does that play out in the contemporary American Jewish community? Uh, well, a little over 20 years ago, while I was president of the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College, um, we passed a rule that said that no relationship of a romantic or sexual nature could take place between any student and any member of the faculty. And of course, we only have graduate students and many of them are as old or older than faculty members. But we recognize that anytime there is a power imbalance between the two people involved in a relationship, that impairs the possibility of giving consent. And impaired consent in our thinking uh, was no consent at all. Uh, so the only way to ensure the safety of students is to uh, make it um, an actionable offense to get involved with them romantically or sexually. Um, I have had, as the head of an institution, uh, been in the situation where uh, a young female a person on the development staff uh, was harassed by a donor who uh, she complained to the head of her department who brought the matter to me. And because I really am committed to this notion of tochacha, um, I went directly to the donor and said his uh, conduct was unacceptable and uh, that we would not allow him to have further contact with the development staff if there was ever another incident. Um, he was really angry, which was very scary since he was a very major donor. Um, and he didn't talk to me for about six weeks. Um, ultimately, it worked out. But my feeling was there is no excuse for sacrificing the integrity of your institution over money. Uh, once integrity is damaged, it's extraordinarily hard to restore. Um, I've also been in the situation of having to uh, investigate accusations of um, sexual misconduct. And while I have had the experience of um, a false accusation, um, it has also been my experience that if you dig, when you're doing that kind of investigation, there are almost always multiple accusers. And when there are multiple accusers, I have never had an instance where um, the person who was accused wasn't guilty. I do note that very, very often the guilty party um, doesn't really understand what they did wrong. And part of the challenge in dealing with this institutionally is getting them to understand that their experience of what happened, and in the cases I've investigated, the women's experience of what has happened are completely non-congruent. And it is a critical part of dealing with the situation to get the man to recognize what the women's experience has been. Um, so what can funders do? Well, one of the things that I hope funders will do is uh, request copies of the organization's policies in these areas from their grantees. Uh, it is quite clear that young organizations and I'm a consultant for a number, so I can say this with certainty, have often do not develop policies about harassment uh, for quite a long time. And that's a problem because without clear rules in place that can be discussed with employees and reviewed with board members, 
there is insufficient protection within the organization, even when the leaders of the organization um, agree that such conduct is reprehensible. Uh, so having written policies and making those policies the subject of review and agreement for employees and for board members is a really critical part of uh, ensuring a, a safe environment. And the same, by the way, holds true uh, for an organization that involves large numbers of volunteers. Um, they too can be a source of problems, both to each other and to staff members. And it's important for organizations to let volunteers know that there's a code of conduct that's expected of them as well. So let me stop there. Hang on. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, David and Sarah. Um, before we turn it over to Lisa, um, I just want to have a couple of follow-up questions for, for both of you. Um, and also, I want to mention something as well that JFN has been engaged in. Um, you both talked about um, rumors and dealing with rumors when they surface and circulate and the imperative to, to speak up. Um, um, uh, I'd like for both of you to share a little bit of, uh, about, for, from Sarah, from your perspective, from the anecdotal evidence that, and research that you've been collecting, and David, from your experience, how exactly does one go about investigating when all you have are sort of, sort of circulating innuendos and rumors and, and nothing yet has been verified and documented? What's the best path forward in, the, in those circumstances? Um, David, would you like to take this one first? Sure. Okay. Uh, if the accusation centers on an individual or individuals, and it usually does, um, the first thing I have done is uh, attempted to figure out who are the people in their immediate circle who may have been victims of harassment and um, met with them individually with the promise of uh, anonymity if they choose it and and of clearing anything that goes out about them and their situation um, in the future uh, before anything goes to make sure that they understand that they control the information about themselves um, and then uh, interviewing and it's my experience that in that first round of interviews with the people who work with that person the most closely they themselves may be uh, able to report incidents that involve them, or often uh, they know who else they would suggest that I talk to. Um, in, in one uh, very unpleasant one that uh, I worked on, um, I started out with uh, one name and ended up with seven. And um, by the time those women uh, realized that there were seven of them, they were then willing to come forward as a group. And, and uh, that's usually the case. It's very difficult to get the first accuser to go public, or at least it used to be. I think now in the current environment, it may be easier than it was uh, a few months ago. Um, but um, but it's hard to get one person to come forward, but if you can interview them individually and accumulate the names and then get permission to bring them together, they will come forward usually as a group. And that's really powerful because the accused may be able to turn it into a he said, she said, when there's a single, a, a single person who's the object of impropriety. But when there are seven or even three, and usually with two, um, denials are, are, are usually fruitless. Thank you, David. I also wanted to, to bring up, um, you know, or underscore rather, what you said about trust. Um, you, you implied not only was it that you assured the confidence um, of the individuals and what they said would be remain in confidence, but the fact that they trusted you in the first place, that they felt that it was a safe space to share their stories. Um, wanted to underscore that as well. Um, in fact, the, the response to our article was rather mixed. Um, I, I wrote the article with Richard um, together, and uh, when the responses I heard came mostly from, uh, on the whole, younger women, professionals who are in their earlier mid-career, 
um, the response they felt was that their stories were heard and validated in a, for some and for the first time. Um, and they were really inspired by the idea of movement happening in the field. Um, many of the people from whom Richard heard directly were older male professionals, many of whom are in C-suite or executive positions. Um, and their response was more, what do we do about this? Will this change everything about how we work? Um, despite wanting to do the right thing, um, they were quite nervous about how, how to implement that logistically. And so I'm glad, first of all, Samantha, that you're asking the question. Um, I'm not quite sure exactly what to make of, of that just yet, except that there's a, uh, I wanted to recognize that as an issue as well. Um, and that the work JFN is doing in supporting all of these types of groups in implementation um, is significant. Great. Thank you both. I, I want to push a little bit uh, further on the issue of rumor. And we're curious um, about the distinction between rumor versus Lashon Hara, so evil tongue or gossip. And David, maybe you can comment on, you know, what are we as Jews required to reveal and investigate based on rumor versus Lashon Hara? And I mean, it may not be funder related per se, but it's, it's certainly humanity related. Uh, so Lashon Hara is a very broad category. It's all forms of uh, negative speech. Um, but it's clear that there are certain kinds of negative speech that are not only permitted, but required. Uh, for example, there's a category of Azhara, warning. Uh, when someone could endanger themselves by putting themselves in a difficult situation, and you know something about the people in that situation, you have an obligation to warn them to prevent them from putting themselves in that dangerous situation. Uh, so, and it is also clear that when someone does something wrong, uh, it is appropriate to launch an accusation uh, and and to create an investigation. Um, that's partly because you want to provide them with the opportunity of tshuva, of, of uh, repentance, return, but it is also because we have an obligation to create a safe space. Um, so there are many times when it is appropriate to speak up. Ideally, uh, when someone wants to make an accusation, they will make it in a formal way through a formal process rather than through gossip. But as we all know, sometimes uh, speaking truth to power is really scary. You worry about whether it's going to damage your reputation or your ability to get promoted or your um, your general well-being. And so sometimes what happens when we feel threatened is we talk to our close friends for support instead. Um, it's then the, uh, the job of the institution to, to pick up on those rumors and to run them to ground to try and figure out the truth of the situation. Um, whether accusations are made anonymously um, or directly, um, we still have an obligation to in, investigate them. Um, and the, you know, the Torah term is you shall not stand idly by the blood of your neighbor. And that doesn't just refer to physical blood. Um, so even in the case just of rumor, we have to do our best to, to try to investigate. Um, one of the things I found has really helped me in terms of investigations that I've done um, is uh, that previous investigations I've done, the institutions have often um, gone into detail in revealing the outcomes to uh, the employees who've been damaged. And the result of that is, uh, you know, I can depend on trust that comes from the previous situations I've been involved in. And that, that helps me uh, gain the trust of uh, new people whom I meet. Um, the question of how to investigate uh, partly has to do with how we gain trust before such incidents occur. 
Um, do we have a CEO who's spoken out publicly and clearly to staff about a zero tolerance policy for, zero, for sexual harassment? Uh, do we have a chair of um, the human relations group or director of, of HR uh, who has shown him or herself to be someone who is more concerned with victims than the reputation of the institution? Um, when people have a reputation for being um, interested in a cover-up or interested in um, protecting higher-up employees, trust is very hard to come by. So this is the issue of trust isn't a one-time thing. It's an ongoing question of how we conduct ourselves and not just what we do, but how we talk about what we do, because that's also part of how we generate trust. Terrific. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to Lisa Eisen, who um, is going to discuss safety and respect in the workplace and the direct correlation between abuse of power and the lack of women's leadership in the workplace. And she's also going to share with us a little bit about a pledge that um, she and others in the field are working on. So Lisa, over to you. Thank you, Samantha. And thank you to JFN for addressing this very important topic head on and in a timely manner. Um, so first, I just uh, want to contextualize a little bit, as, as Samantha alluded to, you know, where this problem sits. It's obviously a larger cultural moment uh, that we are looking at with Me Too and in our community, Gamani. And um, the time is really now for us to, uh, to address this and to take action. Uh, and, and really not just to be talking, but to be doing specific um, redress against the, the, the problems in our community. Um, this is a broad problem in the Jewish community as it is in every other industry and every other sector. But I wanna just say it right out, this is a funder problem. It is our problem. And uh, Sarah has talked about some of the anecdotes that, that she has found. These are corroborated by a survey that came out this year in the Good People Fund uh, with numerous examples of fundraisers, female CEOs, um, female rabbis, others uh, reporting being harassed, assaulted, et cetera, by, by donors. Um, and um, especially in the context of a, a solicitation meeting or a philanthropic interaction, be it a foundation head, a donor, a board chair, what have you. So um, it is a problem in our community. And um, I think this kind of behavior, it's an abuse of what is already a very imbalanced power dynamic between funders and, and organizational professionals. Uh, not to mention, of course, as we've heard uh, already, unethical and, and inappropriate. So I, I think given the fact that we, we know uh, anecdotally and through surveys and additional surveys are, are actually being conducted uh, as we speak, um, we have an obligation as funders and we also have the power and the resources to do something about this in our community. Um, the second contextual piece I want to say is that this is about safety and trust, but it's also about respect. And this uh, issue of sexual harassment is part of a broader context of the role of women and other underrepresented uh, professionals and individuals in the Jewish community. Um, and I think we know that we have a, a community in which we have a majority of organizations led by, by males and the majority of uh, professionals being women in many, in many, many cases, foundations or organizations. Um, and we only have to look to the, um, the recent forward salary, salary survey in which, uh, you know, you had to look down all the way to number 29 until you even found a woman listed and the pay differential is quite stark. So I think we, we need to just acknowledge that um, this broader context in which the voices of women and the leadership of women are not um, where they should be and the pay equity is not where it should be. It provides fertile ground for this kind of power dynamic. Um, to exist, and that's the, the ground which often uh, concede this kind of behavior. 
So from my perspective, as a, as you know, speaking as a, a foundation professional, um, and as a longtime professional in the Jewish community, I think it's, it's our obligation to uphold our Jewish values. Um, it's an ethical uh, issue, and it's also in our own self-interest because we are not going to be able to attract the kind of talent to our organizations if we don't uh, change the culture. And um, we're partners as funders with these organizations, and we need them to carry out our philanthropic vision. And so we need to make sure that they have uh, the best possible leadership and culture and talent to do that. So, um, and that, that is a culture free of gender disparagement and bias, free of um, harassment, and one that, that uh, elevates the role of, of women in, in, the, in the leadership. So that's sort of the context in which I'm, I'm viewing this issue, but I wanna also be very practical about what we can do as funders. And um, I have six you know, specific areas that, uh, that I'd like to, to briefly put forward and we can discuss them in more detail. Uh, the first is we have to take responsibility and ensure accountability um, as, as funders um, for ourselves and for the organizations that we support as our grantees and for the broader community. Um, and in that respect, um, I am uh, with, with a number of other foundations and organizations beginning to work on uh, a pledge that we would uh, subscribe to as a community and or organizations and foundations and individuals could uh, sign on to a pledge to make change, to uphold appropriate standards, to um, take a lead on addressing sexual harassment in our community and, and misconduct. And uh, it would be backed by tangible resources, both financial and uh, technical assistance to actually make it real and, and to enable us to, to walk the talk. Um, we can talk more about that later. Um, secondly, and I, I think David uh, really showed the, the example of this, we have to exhibit leadership. Um, when he stood up to one of his largest donors and said, we're not going to stand for this, um, that was leadership, and we need the leaders of our organizations to essentially say, um, this behavior cannot be tolerated. Um, we're going to have a culture in which people are respected and they feel safe, um, and that we create a lot more awareness and, and accountability through leadership. Um, I've been speaking in my work with uh, the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, they issued a, an amazing report, which I recommend looking at um, on harassment in the workplace. A number of powerhouse Jewish women who are commissioners and staff there worked on the report. And um, they're very much uh, interested in what we're doing here as a community. And they s essentially said without leadership um, to recognize those people who behave appropriately or who come forward, or, and to put a stop to, uh, to behavior, you know, none of this can happen. It's really the sign of Kwan Um Third is just refreshing all of our own policies and procedures so that um, our own house is in order and helping our grantees do that as well um, and, in, and ensuring that they do as part of our funding arrangement with them. Um, and I think uh, we've started actually, we're, we're updating our grant application so that we will ask for copies of, of policies, but we're also going to provide templates and examples and best practices to help our grantees, um, you know, be as, as uh, up to date and compliant as possible. Uh, fourth is training for staff and board. And here again, the EEOC is very um, clear and I think has gotten a sense of the, the cutting edge of what training is appropriate. Um, it's annual, it's in person, it's for staff and for lay leaders. And um, it's not just sort of your check the box kind of training. It's really um, much more about how do you uphold respect and, and safety and pre prevent uh, discrimination in the workplace. And it, one piece in particular that is very important is about how do you empower bystanders? on this issue of you know complicity and uh not standing idly by 
empowering bystanders is a big part of what an uh, effective training. And that's something that we can, we can help support. We can pay for that for our grantees. We can pay for it for the community. It's a role as funders we can help advance. Um, and then facilitate reporting and enforcement. Um, for all the reasons we've heard already and many more, it's not always easy to, um, to report on these issues. Sometimes when they're reported on, they're not dealt with appropriately, where people are told, oh, that's just you know, how he is, and he's older and he doesn't get it, or this or that, or we need the money, we need the gift. Um, or you know, it's possible that people just don't really know the appropriate ways um, to report, and that is something that was actually uh, discovered in a recent leading edge study that um, two thirds of employees uh, in Jewish organizations know, only two thirds know that they have a harassment policy and only one third know what they should do or where they should go if there is an incident. So that's some work that we can do as a, as a community as well. And there, there are very specific ideas about neutral reporting platforms, some new apps that are being developed. Um, there's a lot that, um, that, that we could potentially support as funders to help make it okay to do whistleblowing and, and to actually ensure that uh, perpetrators are, are dealt with appropriately. Um, and finally, most important is taking very clear and immediate steps to address the role of women in organizations, uh, closing the, the gender gap on pay, uh, promoting women as leaders of organizations, uh, making sure that our search committees always include women and, and as members and as candidates, not agreeing not to speak on panels where women uh, are not appearing. Uh, there are many, many more ways that this can, um, can be addressed, but until we have a culture in which everyone feels equally represented and heard, um, it will be hard to make the kind of change that we're talking about in our community. Terrific, terrific. Thank you so much, Lisa. It's great to hear concrete, talkless types of uh, steps that we as a community can take. Um, I wanna ask about um, uh, best practices and templates. Um, uh, David, both you and Lisa um, talked about um, the importance of um, policies. And I fear that these policies exist like um, on bookshelves and they're not out there in the public sphere. And I'm wondering, is there a, a best practice so that we can be um, sharing, swapping notes, offering advice so that we're not reinventing the wheel over and over again and, and the policies are not sitting on bookshelves. Thoughts about how to, how to do that so that the funder community can communicate about what's, what's most important and how to get it out there. Um, I, I would say a few things. One is the, um, again, the EEOC, they have very, very practical resources. They have checklists for leaders, CEOs, they have checklists for frontline supervisors. They have, so they have very tangible resources that I think could be um, sort of tailored and customized for the Jewish community. There are also organizations in the community that I think are, are using best practice materials. Um, and I, I want to commend, for example, Hillel for the way that they handled the Rhonda Abrams um, case and, and they, they helped make up the difference of losing the funder and they, you know, they, they have policies that are, that are up to date. And I think Eric and his team, have, Fingerhut and his team have really expressed clear leadership on, uh, on that example and on unfortunately other examples that have happened to Hillel professionals. So I, I think those, those exist. And as we're looking through what could we do collectively as a community to address this, um, we need to actually provide sort of a toolkit, a resource guide, a playbook um, that all organizations can use uh, to tailor what are the best practice policies to their organizational needs. So I know that RRC would be happy to make its materials available, um, but one of the things for us as an institution that helped was we've made sure that those uh, policies are in the student handbook 
in the faculty handbook, um, that they are circulated annually um, on the listservs of the organization so that everybody sees them on a regular basis so that they're not buried anywhere. And those policies not only talk about forbidden conduct, but specifically also about reporting mechanisms. And in those reporting mechanisms, it's important to say what to do if you're uncomfortable reporting to the number one person you would normally report to, because everybody's uncomfortable with somebody in a large workplace. And it's really important for there to be backup ways that people can report uh, things that have made them uh, uncomfortable. Um, when RRC was drawing on policies, uh, we turned to other colleges and universities because uh, they were earlier in adopting some policies. Uh, and what we discovered was uh, quite a number of the places we looked at did not actually follow best practices. So when you're accumulating templates to look at for your organization, make sure that you start out with some ideas about what you're looking for because when people proudly send you policies, sometimes you will find they don't meet the standards they ought to meet. Terrific. Lisa, you talked about the, a pledge and a, a pledge for accountability. Um, how can funders on the call find out more about the pledge, um, at, get engaged in it, in that work? Um, well, let me say that we're, we're a little early on, but I, I am um, convening a, a small group of folks to actually sort of just get the framework uh, together and there will be more information to follow. But the idea is that, um, and, and I think we were validated actually by the Time's Up initiative was announced as we were in the middle of planning it, because it's a similar idea to have a common banner that we can all get behind, um, but that individually as leaders, as organizations, we can, we can tailor our responses uh, appropriately, but that we are committing collectively to make change and to have very tangible steps and to have resources, as I said, both financial and technical behind it. So um, stay tuned. I, we will be sharing more information as we get a little bit, bit more uh, crystallized. Um, and I will say that um, the, the idea of the pledge and uh, some of the other practical steps that I recommended are, are laid out in a little more detail in an op-ed that uh, that appeared in JTA today. Uh, so can, can I add one other thing? Um, I noticed that only between a quarter and a third of the people signed up for this call were male. Um, I want to be really clear. I perceive this to be a men's problem. Um, unless when we don't treat women the way they ought to be treated, it damages our institutions, it damages our relationships. It is not just a women's problem. And uh, unless we see men fully participating as full partners in dealing with these problems, we're not going to get the level of change we need. And that help shouldn't just be reluctance to avoid embarrassment, it should be recognizing that when we observe best practices, practices, we strengthen our institutions, we strengthen our moral character, and we uh, improve the quality of the outputs of what we're trying to achieve. Amen. I'm, I'm with you on that. Um, I also wanted to add something. I mean, Lisa, we will circulate the JTR, J JTA article after the call to all the participants. And if there are the resources that you can point us to from the EEOC, we, we would like to share those as well. I'll also add that JFN today just um, released an update to a document that we initially uh, released in 2016, which is called Funders and Power, Principles for Honorable Conduct and Philanthropy. Um, that document had um, initially seven principles for the, uh, uh, appropriate funder grantee relationships and and how uh, the and power dynamics and we just released um, an update which now includes an eighth dimension a new section um, which is all about um, ensuring the personal safety dignity and equality of all people um, rooted in um, kavod habriot human dignity and if you'd like to read more about um, what we've prepared, you can find it on our website and we will certainly distribute it to all the participants after today's call as well. 
um, it's it's really speaking truth to power as as all three of you panelists have have said in, on multiple occasions during today's presentation. Um, I want to open it up to questions uh, from the from participants, and I'm wondering. I, I'm not sure if anybody has a question. I don't see anything typed into our chat box. Um, and I reckon, oh, did somebody just, I recognize that, you know, it, it, people may feel awkward or uncomfortable coming forward with questions, particularly about this topic, but I want to encourage you, if you don't have a question, perhaps you can share with us, you know, what you're doing as a funder to, or, to tackle this issue. I mean, share the things that you're learning about and what you're hearing. Um, we'd like to open it up. So while we allow for the technology to happen, um, we can, we can, you can offer your comments anonymously as well. I don't need to um, mention your name. We're going to we're going to allow uh, questions. I think I see somebody's question that just came through. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read it out loud to, uh, to our panelists. I like Sarah's idea for a legal aid fund type effort to support nonprofit professionals. Um, that, was, that was mentioned um, at the beginning of our, uh, of our call today. Curious if funders have thought similarly about some type of pooled effort to provide yeah financial backing guarantees to organizations that are going to potentially lose a major donor as the result of confronting misconduct? That's a great question. Anybody want to comment on it? Well, what, what I would say is that um, the idea of creating a pool of funds to provide real teeth behind an initiative, a, a call to action is definitely out there. Um, the question of exactly what, what it would look like and should it be a legal defense fund? Should it be for making up lost gifts? Should it be for you know innovative initiatives, training, all of the above? Um, I think it could be, um, and there maybe there'll be multiple funds, but I do think if we're going to act there's going to have to be dollars behind this. There's going to have to be commitment behind it. And there's going to have to be a lot of technical assistance uh, from experts who, who will help us figure out what standards we need to be upholding. Great. Thank you, Lisa. Um, any other thoughts or comments about that? I think Lisa said it best. I mean, and thank you, Jonathan, for, for your question. Uh, being that I'm not a funder, I can't speak to whether or not other funders are interested in this, but um, it would certainly be an interesting point of conversation among funding funder convenings um, and other things happening in this season. Um, I think there are certainly, as Lisa you pointed out, there there's funding that's needed for all aspects of this, the legal aid uh, piece of it, the um, supporting the lost gifts, um, the technical assistance piece, um, as you quoted the leading edge study, you know, even if more than two thirds of your employees know that there's a policy, and even if more than one third of them know what the policy is, that doesn't mean it's a good policy. Um, it's incumbent upon us, many organizations, and we mentioned this in our article, um, don't have some provisions in there for um, employee donor relationships. Only, um, you know, if misconducts happens, employee to employee. Um, and that's critical for much of what we're speaking about as well. Terrific. Great. Um, anybody else have a question from, the, from participants, from the audience, or any other thoughts that you'd like to share? And while we're waiting for that to come on, um, I, I just wanted to put a plug in for a program that's happening in New York City on January 25th. Um, it's co-sponsored by a number of organizations, and I, I believe it's being um, spearheaded by the Jewish Women's Foundation of New York um, and Jamie Black's organization. I think that uh, it's the evening of January 25th, and it's all about um, sharing stories about Me Too. Um, the title of the program is Revealing Me Too as We Too in Jew Jewish Communal Life and Evening of Discussion and Action. I think that they've, um, registration it may be maxed out, but they are taking a waiting list. So if you're interested, please, uh, please have a look on our website for, the, for a link to register. Uh, we just got a, a, another question um, from a participant. 
Sexual harassment training can sound outdated, even dull. How do we ensure we harness the wisdom of the day to make it relevant and effective? And I'll just add a, another dimension to that, which is um, handbooks are also dull. And like, yes, we can put the information and the policies in them, but people may not read them. So how do we, how do we make this empowering um, and while making sure people are, are schooled and trained in, in, in the appropriate work? Well, I, I can just talk to what I've learned through, um, through the research I've been doing and my conversations uh, with the folks at the EOC and with others who have been working on training. And I, I do want to shout out um, uh, the Jewish Women's Foundation of New York and Martin Kaminer and uh, the Good People Fund have been working together on providing trainings for, for Jewish institutions. Um, look, I think... In many ways, a lot of this is not just about, you know, naming and shaming and, and Me Too and Gamani. It's about just having the basic um, attributes of a respectful and safe workplace. And so, um, you know, it's like having a, a fire escape plan and having, you know, the basic things that you need to have them. But in order for them to come to life, in order, you got to practice, you got to train, etc. And so, um, some of the the modern wisdom uh, that, that that you refer to that I think makes training today more effective is making it about respect and safety more generally, um, and and not saying this is a sexual harassment training that you just sort of go online for half an hour a year and check off a box that you did it. Um, they definitely have found that in person trainings are the most effective. Um, focusing on on the whole idea of respect uh, and harassment in a broader context, not even just sexual harassment, uh, are, are, are the most effective ways. And as I mentioned earlier, this idea of empowering bystanders has been really, bystanders has been very relevant and resonant and um, helps bring uh, the training to life. I, I know of two um, trainers who are very, adept in this area who I have, I haven't personally experienced, but have been recommended to me by multiple people. One is Fran Seppler, who actually developed the training for respect and safety in the workplace for the EOC. She, she did the training that, that Martin uh, provided. Um, and is, it will be also training uh, the entire Hillel team this year. And uh, it comes very highly recommended from the EOC. And then another particular person who I think is of relevance to this call is Richard Waters, who actually does uh, seminars and, and training for nonprofit management professionals. But there are very few people like him and, and Fran. I mean, there are very few people offering these trainings. And one thing we really have to focus on is in our rabbinical schools and in the Jewish nonprofit management schools, these trainings aren't happening. People are not being trained how to deal with these situations from an, either a management or an employee perspective. No, the amount of training varies institution to institution. So, for example, um, Bobby Brightman, who's uh, got a social work background, and I do a two-day mini course at RRC just on boundaries and maintaining boundaries. So what you find if you look across the institutions is that uh, what's going on in them varies considerably institution to institution. Um, the other thing that was implicit in what Lisa said that I just want to pull out and underline is virtually no institution has someone in-house who can do a good job with this. So when, when Lisa was saying, um, think about trainers, what's implied there is you've got to expect that you need a budget to bring in someone from outside on a regular basis to do this kind of human resource training. And it's gotta be someone who um, has credibility style and, and personality wise with the people they're gonna be training. Um, connected to that, the most effective trainings I've seen have created enough safety so that the people inside the institution could tell their own stories. And that to me has been the most powerful part of the trainings that I've been part of. Uh, when people say, this is what happened to me and this is how it made me feel, that has transformative power for their colleagues in a way that storytelling from outside the institution doesn't really. So 
in order for that to happen, you need a trainer who's really good at creating safe space. Yeah, that's great. Terrific. Um, we just got another question, which um, is very relevant to, to the work that I do here at JFN, and I'd like to read it out loud. Would the panelists address the issue of conferences and other informal semi-social gatherings that are common, particularly for networking and fundraising, and which can inadvertently place grantee staff in uncomfortable situations? Is anyone aware of specific changes being made in this regard and how these situations are being addressed in policies, best practices? So does anybody have any thoughts or comments? And there are lots of situations where um, mentor-mentee relationships or light social relationships exist where there's a power imbalance where these things are problems. And I just came back from a, an academic conference where one of the younger women complained about discomfort she had when she turned to uh, a more established uh, professor in the field for advice. Um, so these kinds of issues come up all over the place, uh, especially for uh, in situations where women hope to turn to uh, older people for mentoring in a can be in an informal situation over coffee or a drink. And so one of the issues is um, making education an ongoing aspect of all of these things for funders and for mentors and and creating for associational situations um, rules and education and um, in the academic world that is happening not nearly enough um, incidents of impropriety can be heard about almost daily um, and in my experience in in social gatherings involving um, funders in the Jewish community, it is very often in those informal situations where the problems are the worst. Right. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, personally, I, I, I'm i thinking, and, and, and to whoever asked the question, I I haven't heard of, of movement in this area yet, and I'm really glad you brought it up so that all of us on this call can think about it more. Um, it's, it's difficult because uh, especially with a lot of these social events, alcohol is a factor. And we know that that makes everything um, in terms of consent, in terms of uh, harassment, in terms of um, the very blurry line between power and power dynamics, um, so much more complicated. And um, we also know that a lot of times, um, these are the ways in which people, as David was saying, are able to network, especially those that are younger, especially those that aren't a part of a certain established social, you know, boys club, as they used to be called um, in the field. And so we need to really be thinking about how we can empower younger professionals to get to know on an informal social basis, some of these um, mentors and, and funders and all of these things, um, but in a way that is safe for everyone. Great. And I'll just add, um, we at JFN, um, for our conferences, have always had um, sort of guidelines for appropriate behavior. And um, this year, for the first time, we've added a, a new dimension, which um, speaks to uh, JFN not tolerating harassment of any kind toward any person from any person at this conference, whether funders, speakers, panelists, JFN staff, hotel staff, security staff, or anyone else. Um, in general and in every way, not otherwise specified here, be a mensch. So that's all very clearly articulated now on our website um, for conference uh, uh, programming. Um, we are just about out of time. Um, this has been an extraordinary conversation. Our panelists, Sarah, Lisa, David, I, we are so grateful to you for your wisdom and for um, for engaging in this complicated um, but so important uh, topic. And um, I know that this is definitely not the end of this conversation. We will certainly be 
um, continuing in many forms to carry on this dialogue. And for those of, um, of you on, on the phone today, if you have uh, other ideas for how JFN can further engage in this, um, in this particular um, arena, please be in touch with, with me. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Again, I wanna thank our panelists and for everybody who participated today. Um, let's, uh, we're gonna close it at that. Thanks again. Take care.